it's time for another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas, the podcast covering the intersection of business, culture, entrepreneurship, and life in general here in the Ozarks. Whether you are considering a move to this area or trying to learn more about the place you call home, we've got something special for you. Here's our host, Randy Wilburn. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. I'm your host, Randy Wilburn, and I'm excited to be with you today. As I always am, I'm sitting here in the Furman Garner Performance Studio at KUAF public radio here in Northwest Arkansas. Certainly want to encourage you to support them where and when possible. And as you guys already know, the drill, this episode comes on, is featured on Ozarks at Large every Tuesday. So they typically take a segment of our show and share it out on the Ozarks at Large for that Tuesday. So Hopefully you'll hear this particular episode while you're driving in your car, maybe somewhere, even if you haven't subscribed to the podcast. So, but I'm excited to be with a good friend of mine, Alvin Singh. And Alvin and I go back to his days at Kiva and working with uh, Martha Londigan and and just, you know, we just, that's kind of, I think where we originally met. And then what I didn't know was that Alvin was carrying a deep, dark secret with him that he hadn't shared with me. And that secret was simply that he was the great nephew of Lead Belly, the famous musician Lead Belly, who arguably is the person that created the whole term woke. (laughs) So, which I thought was really interesting. And I learned more about that recently. And as a historian myself, I really appreciate when I learn new things about history that I think I knew, or, or at least I think I have a handle on. And that was certainly not the case when it came to Lead Belly. And so I had Alvin come visit my Rotary Club, which is the downtown Fayetteville Rotary. It's the largest Rotary Club in Northwest Arkansas. And he spoke about Lead Belly. And there were so many musicians in that club that love Lead Belly and love Johnny Cash. And I mean, just love really good music especially blues music. And so, and because we're in kind of like right at the footsteps or a doorstep of the Delta, you know, blues is big, especially in Arkansas. And so I thought it would be great to have Alvin come on. They just recently did a juke joint presentation with him and and several others in this area at the Prior Center where they showed what a juke joint looked like. And, you know, if you walked into the atrium of the Prior Center, you would see the juke joint sitting up in one location. And so there's just a lot of history in Northwest Arkansas as it relates to blues music. And this is no exception. And so I thought, you know what, why don't we bring on Alvin? He lives here in Northwest Arkansas. He has a kinship with uh, Lead Belly. And why don't we bring him on the podcast to share his story? Because I think you guys would really be interested in this. So without further ado, Alvin Singh, I wanted to you welcome doing? you to the podcast. And this is actually not the first time that you've been on the podcast. No. You were on with when we talked mm, about Martha. Kiva. Yep, yep. Yeah, with Martha. Good. Thank so. you, man. Thank you for letting me join and hello <laughs> to everybody listening. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, certainly it's my pleasure. I would love for you just to kind of talk about Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. And why don't you just kind of give, just talk a little bit about who Lead Belly is and just talk about the relevance to both the music world, but more importantly, to the regional audience here in Arkansas. Yeah. So Lead Belly, to give a visual for all the audio people, the image that I get of him is John Henry. Yeah. You know, the guy who built the railroad, that that big folk. Sure. Hero. And so, and actually, Liberty has a song called John Henry. Okay. And so that's the image. Somebody who short stature is what Pete Seeger said and very, you know, he, he spent time in a chain gang. So he's originally from Shreveport, Louisiana, but he grew up playing guitar in Dallas, Texas and Texarkana area with Blind Lemon Jefferson, who's, you know, another legend himself. And I love, I don't know about, I gotta yeah, stop for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the names. <laughs> no. The names more than anything else. Blind Lemon. I mean, it's like, I mean, who, who thinks of that? Nobody, I mean, you know, well, and I'm sure there's a story behind every it, name. I was going to say, well, the, speaking of Arkansas, Jeff Place at Smithsonian, I asked that. I said, well, what do you think of the names? He said, there's a guy named Ironhead that did the first recording of Rock Island Line. 
Okay. So, and he was another prisoner. And I was like, ah, okay. So these were kind of like, you know, like today rappers' names, you know? Sure, like, sure. You know, so you got Iron Head and you got Lead Belly and Blind Lemon and all like, of these like, guys. Like if you think of like Raekwon and Ghostface Killer. Right, right. <laughs> Method Man and right. all that. Yeah, so, okay. So that was that. And so his real name, Hudy Ledbetter, so it probably rhymed with that, Lead Belly. He spent a lot of time playing in, like you said, juke joints, you know, bar taverns, everywhere he could play in the deep elms in, in actual Dallas. And he actually spent, and we can go more into this later, but he actually spent two prison terms that he infamously or famously were, he sung his way out of prison. Yeah. Uh, then he lived in New York City, befriended people like Woody Guthrie, Paul Robeson, Josh White, Sonny Terry. Uh, list goes on and on, even was befriending the guy who was the director of Rebel Without a Cause. Okay. Ten okay. years before the movie came out. Right, right. Uh, Nicholas, his name Nicholas Ray. Okay. Uh, so these were really good friends of him, Harry Belafonte. The list goes on. And then he passed away in 1949 from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Oh, wow. Which at that time was still, Lou Gehrig was the only other person. Iron Man himself, sure, you know, Iron Man sure. of baseball. Right. And so that's, and then, so that was in 49. And th- after that, it's been actually more history and stuff from his passing to today. Really? You know, and his influence. So, man. Yeah. And so I think, you know, and here's the thing, and folks that are listening to this, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. I'm going to link to as much as I can in the show notes based on this conversation. But there, you just recently were at an event at the Apollo, the yeah. world famous Apollo Theater, yeah. where you got to sit down with Kai Wright, who is the host of what's the name of the Notes program? from America? Notes from America mm-hmm. on WNYC which is at WNYC has some of the longest running radio programs, period, on radio. And you he interviewed you live in front of a studio, in front of an audience of people at the Apollo Theater to talk about Lead Belly and to talk about, you know, the fact that he had come up with the expression, stay woke, I think is what he said. Yep. But it wasn't necessarily used in the same way that it's been used today, although it has been, it has actually been co-opted and utilize this way. A lot of times we hear things and we think, oh, that's fresh. That's new. And, and a lot of times it's not new. It's, not, mm-hmm. it's been around for a long yeah, time. You yeah. know, I was talking with a good friend of yours as, as before you walked in and we were talking about how the influence of music carries on from one generation to another and how you can hear the influence of Lead Belly's music in Johnny Cash's music. Right. And then you hear the influence of Johnny Cash's music in somebody else's music that is current. Right. And all of that dates back to Lead Belly and others that played during those early years. And so, and especially when you hear the lyrics of some of the stuff that Lead Belly created, you're like, man, he was way ahead of his time. Yep. And at the same time, he was just dealing with life as a black man in Jim Crow in the Jim Crow South. Yep. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's, at, at the same time, at the same right. time. Yeah. So I think it's, I think it's really interesting. So. Yeah. No, uh, musically. So on that point, He's, he played the 12-string guitar. Mm-hmm. So he called himself the king of the 12-string guitar. That is to separate himself. He was, you know, was also a big part of marketing himself. And even today, it's hard. I, I meet guitarists all the time. I say, you know, do you play the 12-string? No. You know, so very few people play it. It's very loud. It's a lot more strings. Mm-hmm. Well, 12. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so... That's his the musical background. Now, the, the, the event that you were talking about was a Martin Luther King celebration, and the theme was Martin Luther King woke. Mm-hmm. And I started it off by giving the origins of the first time we heard the word woke, right. which on recorded um, song that he did on Scottsboro Boys, right. which is Scottsboro, Arkansas, sure. I know, which I still haven't understood that part because the train left from Chattanooga, but... The fight took place in Alabama. Yeah. But the court trial was called the Scarsboro Boys. And then Liberty says when you go down to Alabama. So that, I think that's because the train stopped there maybe. But right. needless to say, in that song, at the very end, he explains as a warning, you know, if you go down south, stay woke. Right. But you should keep your head on the swivel. In 1962, the next time we saw the word woke was a New York Times op-ed from William his name is, cross my name, but it's William Kelly. Okay. K-E-L-L-E-Y. And he mentions just on a headline about staying woke. After that, you know, it's used in protests and just in vernacular. But Erica Badu has a song called Master Teacher where she says stay woke. 
So that's, and then today, you know, it's, it's just a common term that we always see. What I recognize from that is there's woke and then there's wokeness. Mm-hmm. So wokeness is more of a pejorative. Is it more like a yeah. negative, right? You know, yeah. it's more, oh, you're a tree hugger. Sure. You know, yeah, if I, yeah, if I, yeah. You know, many of my friends come to my house and they see my recycle just piled up. <laughs> and I say, yeah, I'm about to, you know, take it to the recycle. Oh, you're a tree hugger. And it's, it's a joke or, is, you know, are they trying to, you know, make fun of make me? Fun and of they're me, not yeah. really kind of, you know, congratulating me. No, so yeah. wokeness, uh, as we hear a lot of political, you know, pundits and people say that, cancel culture and wokeness. Right. And they just kind of mention it as something negative. What I think in, in, in the reference to Dr. King and anybody really woke is more being aware. Right. In Ledbelly's case, yes, he was talking about racial injustices. But I think that the term can still expand to many different things, you know, women's rights, uh, climate change, sure. workers' rights, digital privacy rights. You know, that's a real big thing today. Everybody uses all of these technologies and how aware are we of the privacy data? So you can say, hey, stay woke on what you're doing. So that that was the interesting thing about it. And this summer, I was bombarded with emails and links, starting with a morning Joe show mm-hmm. and he, you know, mentions Lead Benny has the picture of him on the screen. Yeah. Talking about the origin. Sure. And then it was Joy Reed show. And then actually Steve Bannon's podcast and Steve Bannon comically actually says this next song is an American Patriot. His name is Lead Belly and he goes on to play Midnight Special. Interesting. So my question has been in this is. If one side is using, you know, woke is for awareness and it's about everybody's understanding of injustices and the other side, well, wokeness is just a distraction mm-hmm. on these things. But the top political strategist for the right, Steve Bannon, calls him a hero. Mm-hmm. And so and that's the guy who created the, you know, this term stay woke. Right. So they, they, they're, they're not in educating their constituents on that. A week after that. The former president is facing a trial in Georgia. Sure. And his lawyers used the Scars Burroughs boys case as an example of why he should extend his trial. <laughs> oh, right. OK. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. The judge comes back and says, ah, there's no mob outside waiting for you. This right. is not, you know, it's not the same. <laughs> yeah, it was a reach. It, it was, it was a a very much yeah. a reach. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so that was interesting where, you know, you're using the Scars Burroughs boys case as an example to extend yours. Sure. But then you're, you know, anti-woke bills and things like that. Yeah. And so it's just a, the people I think more than anything, and that's everybody is the truth. And what can we do without all these different layers and filters on it, you know? Yeah. Well, so let's unpack who yeah. the man was. Yeah. Because, I mean, again, we all say things, right? I have things that I say, you have things that you say, but let's unpack who Lead Belly really was. And and so going back to it, so Lead Belly was actually... Your grandmother was Lead Belly's niece. Yes. Okay. And so, and there, he was born where? He was born in uh, Shreveport. Okay. Shreveport, Louisiana. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 1889. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. He was the second, or uh, the one of two children. Yeah. Parents had farms, so they were pretty self-sustainable. Yeah. And yeah. He grew were they up. were the parents musicians or were no? He... They actually started a church where he's buried now. Okay, and that's where he got his music it's background. Always starts in the church, right? <laughs> Aretha Franklin was twelve <laughs> when she was singing. You know that when her father would have her singing all the time. Tina Turner, Reverend Franklin, too, right? huh? Tina Turner, maybe too. Tina she? Turner, yeah, 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 absolutely. So yeah, a lot of it, uh, there's a lot of uh, a great singers that started in in the church. A, a lot of great musicians start in the church. I mean, you know. Well, a lot of people, Anderson Pac, <laughs> just to bring it to modern day, yeah, yeah, Anderson yeah. Pac is amazing. You hear Anderson Pac, you're like, oh my God, he's great. He started in the church. I wouldn't know that. Yeah, I, know, that. Yeah. I know. I, I listened <laughs> to his story and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is amazing. So, you know. Well, then in the, in the documentary that my, I'm, we're doing, my grandmother speaks on Fannin Street. Fannin Street is still in existence in Shreveport today. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's where 50 Cent's new film studio was at. Okay. And back then it was kind of like a red light district. Yeah. And she jokingly says that, you know, Lead Belly's father would hide him underneath the wagon when driving through Fannin Street, not to see 
you know, the ladies in the windows yeah. and all the stuff going on. And Lead Belly jokingly says the first thing he did when he turned 18 was go, to, go to Fantasy, Fantasy Street. Fantasy. Yeah. You know, that's hilarious. So I'm sure some of our listeners who, who are from Louisiana area know Shreveport might be familiar with Fannin Street, although I don't know if it's the same today as it was then. So, mm-hmm. yeah. But so listen, the connection then really for Lead Belly is you. Right. You're kind of the, I guess, steward, if you will, of the Lead Belly legacy now. And how has it felt for all of that to kind of come on you? The, the mantle of that is you're carrying that now. Yeah. Well, it's something that I'm, I'm honored by. It's something that when I was growing up, I saw my grandmother going to different events mm-hmm. and speaking about him. She would go to conferences. She went to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction all of these different things. And she would just always talk and she would just express her stories. And I saw that Uh, growing up uh, when I was a kid, I saw the, his pardon certificate on the wall and I thought it was a college. uh, (laughs) (laughs) He thought it was a college diploma. Diploma, Right. And it wasn't. (laughs) And so for me, it was more of a history buff like you. Yep. And I wanted to connect those dots. I'm a DJ. So I wanted to connect the musical stuff to it. But what I've realized now is that it's so much and that it's just good to be able to formulate these into new media presentations. Right. Yeah. My sister, she works on the licensing and the business standpoint when people want to do pictures or there's a lead belly burgers in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. Right. Right. Uh, There's a whiskey that some company wanted to do. So she works on that part. I'm more on connecting the dots when Jack White opens up with Good Night Irene or when Keith Richards, you know, is using it in his Netflix series. And, sure. And how these all stories today connect. And so, yeah, I take it as I speak. I do the documentary recently and I try my best to, to represent. To represent. Yeah. I have to. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah. I mean, that's amazing when you think of it. And, and especially nowadays with the value of estates of or of creatives, right? Right. We're going to say anybody's a creative, right? But if you were a creative, if you were a talented artist, and I think of like all of the different people, I mean, now currently I'm thinking about like a Michael Jackson, mm-hmm. but then we can go back to the estate of Marilyn Monroe, mm-hmm. or you mentioned the movie that James Dean was in, right. Rebel Without a Cause. Right. Right. James Dean has an estate. He had, there's a value to the artistic license of using his, his image, his likeness, any type of reflection. And now with AI coming out, it's just a matter of time before they'll be able to say, oh, well, you know, I could have a lead belly ringtone with his, you know, with him telling me or wishing me good morning if because I I just like listening to lead belly. So that's a, that's a, yeah, absolutely. He's got a song. Good morning, blues. Too. Right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah so. well, you know, I mean, I don't know if your listeners know, but Randy himself is, you know, part of a family of, of someone who's <laughs> yeah. just as much as iconic as, as we all think, especially in the media world. Where right. Your grandfather interviewed a lot of. Great legends in his time. Yeah, yeah. No, he he definitely did. And and I kind of feel like you do in terms of trying to steward that because you you never want it to go silent. Right. And you want it to be and, and certainly this is not an episode about me or what, you know, because mm-hmm. actually I'm gonna do an episode very soon Please, for Black yeah, History yeah, Month that is going to talk about, you know, my grandfather and the legacy that he left because I think it's important. Right. Just in the same way that you would want musicians to know about Lead Belly, black musicians, brown musicians, white musicians, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. They need to know the history of the music and where it comes from. I want like every time I see a black reporter or a reporter in general, I want them to know that, hey, there was (laughs) there was a brother running around in the 60s when you didn't have any brothers doing that Mm -hmm. covering the news at a national level. And so, you know, it's like. I think it's important, right? Because people need to see people that look like them yep. that have achieved something in order for them to have some success. As crazy as that sounds, it's true. And for, let's say, artists today that are, are listening today, I have friends who are artists themselves, right? And they're very concerned on making the music, getting it known today. Yeah. What I tell them is, hey, those posters that you go and perform with, save that. Yeah. You know, save these things to curate it because- you know, years from now, your own children or your family members may get asked, hey, do you have <laughs> you the have headphones? Yeah. Do you have yeah. his laptop? Yeah. You know, yeah. that we want to put in the Smithsonian just like us. Yeah, you know, exactly. If you think about it, they just built the Smithsonian Museum less than 10 years ago. Oh, I know. So I know. what's going to happen in the next 40, 50 years of the new stuff and where are they going to collect that from? And so 
Nowadays, you have people go on eBay and buy stuff because they know that that's exactly going to happen. The value is going to be. So, do they have any of Lead Belly stuff? They got his twelve string guitar there. Okay, they do. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. great, great. Yeah, yeah. they got twelve string and a hat. Okay, that he had. Very cool. I have to when I go back the next time. I've only been once. When I go back the next time, I'll have to look for that. I know. Yeah, it was um, in the music I, section. I, I kind of. It was first of all. You, if you're in Washington D.C., you have to visit the National Black History Museum. It's simply amazing. It is there. I mean, there's so many amazing museums in, in Washington, D.C. That's at the top of it as far as I'm concerned. But they're all great. Mm-hmm. But certainly it's being a newer museum and, and the way that they collected the artifacts and they displayed them. Yeah. It was simply I mean, I kind of lost it when I went in. and actually saw my grandfather in there. And it was, oh, you did. OK. Yeah. There's pictures of him because he covered wow. Muhammad Ali when he was still Cassius Clay, when he was fighting a sunny listed in Miami. So, and you know, they made a movie about that, but he covered him and he was actually really good friends with Muhammad Ali. He was invited down there by Malcolm X and he was on, working on behalf of ABC News, but he was down. Yeah, he was down there. So, so there's a couple of pictures of him with, with, with Muhammad and Malcolm X and well, at the time, Cassius Clay's brother. And yeah, it's, so he could have been in the room that one night in Miami, uh, man. Well, he could, you know, he could yeah, have been he certain, he, certainly could have. But, he probably but, was at the same hotel. Might have been. Yeah, might have That was the yeah. only black hotel That's in Miami, true. so he That's had to true. really be there. That is true. And, and, <laughs> and when you think about that, I mean, I know there was some artistic license taken to tell that whole story, but I thought it was a phenomenal story of, of all these icons in a room and just, just the, the things that they were talking about, you know. But yeah, I mean, it, it just it's just, I mean, that museum, back to the museum, it's it's simply amazing. But I will have to make sure that I go back and, and see that 12-string guitar, because I think that, more than anything else, is really is really interesting. But so now the music then, does that mean you guys have the rights to all the music? We, we have the rights. We have a small percentage of it. This okay. is the time we're publishing just started. Yeah. The same publisher that Led Belly has is the same one that did Wimbaway and We Shall Overcome. Oh, wow. Uh, and they started, you know, they're now celebrating their 75th anniversary. Okay. Okay. So then when I calculated, I said 75 years. 1949, that's when Led Belly passed. Right. So essentially right. he started their entire catalog. And who did they, once they pulled him in, they got Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Odetta, Bob, you know, all of these different, you know, folk people. So he kind of started that. And that was the godfather of the publish industry, essentially. Yeah. And you think about like even between here and Memphis, Stax and all these different record companies that, you know, and there were a lot of black record companies that were created. I mean, it's interesting. And it's like you hear like people talk about all the time of the power of the publish. Yeah. And so that's one of the reasons why I think Nas put his daughter as a, as a as gave a her a producer yeah. credit on like most of his stuff, because then that carries on and it carries on like well beyond when Nas is gone. I mean, he's a young, still a young guy for that matter. But you know, you hear those stories and you understand the power of publishing things. And that's where, you know, hopefully as more people know the story that that kind of comes out. Yeah. You know, there is, it's not something uh, that a lot of people would be as proud to think that that happened to them. Yep. It could be on borderline exploitation. Yeah. When they started Lead Belly's publishing, he had already passed away. Sure. So what happened was Alan Lomax went to England Mm -hmm. and saw Lonnie Donegan, who the Beatles were opening up for, playing his entire show with Lead Belly songs. Yep. Lomax goes back and says, well, I know the widow. And how do we get compensation for this? The publisher then says, well, do you have the lyrics written up? And then Lomax says, well, me and Lead Belly worked on a book, which they did in 1935. And I typed the lyrics up while he sang them. Mm. So then he's getting writer credit and, the, you know, the administration publishing is going, you know, the lion's share. So if we was today, the, it would be something that would be renegotiated and hopefully before it all reaches public domain. Yeah. Because, you know, now we're on 75 after, what, 15 more years, it's public exactly. domain. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. I know. It, it is. is interesting. <laughs> it is interesting. So, well, man, I, I hope we... Do you have a song that you have the rights to use and play at, at any time? The one I do know he has 100% is Black Betty. Black Betty. Okay. <laughs> okay. Which Ram Jam, uh, Dukes of Hazard, everybody does that. Does the original exist somewhere or? And that's the, another thing. So Lev Belly took these songs that he learned yep. and then remade them. Yep. So it's, it's remixes of a lot of songs and there's songs that he got that he personally you know, came up with. Okay. I got mm-hmm. you. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Well, man, hopefully one day we, 
we can share some of that on the podcast and, you know, some of that music. I'm, I'm always up for sharing some music that I wouldn't normally be able to share, but because I get permission, I can do that because yeah. everything I share now is like royalty free. So to- well, this is helpful for Arkansas is the song Rock Island Line. When he was, I think me and you were talking about his prison tour. So yeah. when he was released in 1934, mm-hmm. him and Lomax just went on the prison tour and they actually came here to Arkansas. Right. It was Pine Bluff, Tucker. Little Rock. Uh, Little Rock and, and Gold. Gold. Yeah. I'm not sure which one, but he met a guy named Ironhead and then he learned Rock Island Line. Well, Rock Island Line, everybody's recorded that. That was Lonnie Donegan's song, okay. Johnny Cash. I mean, it's endless. So that one's one song that actually has an Arkansas connection to it. Yeah. So tell us, how did he end up in prison? Okay. So the first time was he was performing at a bar. And the way my grandmother, other people tell the story is there was a fight that broke out. Mm -hmm. The guy was jealous that his girlfriend was getting close to Lead Belly. Mm -hmm. And he attempted, he actually cut Lead Belly. And Lead Belly defended himself. And there was a murder. Okay. On that one. So he went to Sugarland, Texas. Mm-hmm. At Sugarland, Texas, while he was serving his term, the governor, Pat Neff, came in and said, you know, what's some entertainment? And they sure enough got lead belly. When he came and performed on the spot, he said, you know, if I had you like you had me, I'd wake up in the morning and set you free. Yeah. So on his last day in office, he pardoned him. Really? Flash forward, there's lead belly's performing throughout the South again. This story is in Shreveport. And it may, have, it may have been a mixed crowd because my grandmother said that he tried to go to the bathroom mm-hmm. and the, one of the white patrons didn't want him to go to the bathroom. Okay. And that fight broke out. Lead Belly probably whooped him up, you know, beat him up pretty bad and then ran for his life to the police department <laughs> where the mob was outside calling for him. This right. is, you know, this yeah. is 1930s. Yeah. And so he didn't serve term in Angola. Wow. That's like one of the roughest prisons in the country. Angola. If not the, you're right. Yeah, if not the roughest prison. Yeah, Angola. If you don't know about Angola, folks, you need to look it up. Go to Wikipedia and uh, and maybe that's the, that's the sanitized version. It's 11,000 it, acres. Yeah. It's like uh, Angola, I would say Parchman Prison, yep. in Mississippi. Yep. Of course, Alcatraz yep. was rough. I've been to actually visited Alcatraz. It was the only prison I was up for visiting because <laughs> I lived in the Bay Area, so- you, had, you just had to go over to The Rock at some point in time. Right. Plus, I loved that movie, Escape from Alcatraz, yeah. with Clint Eastwood. But yeah, I mean, you talk about prisons, and I used to see San Quentin all the time. Okay. And when I was living there, I, in my mind, I was like, wow, that's San Quentin. There lives the, you know, Charles Manson. It's the home of Charles Manson. It's the home of the Night Stalker, yeah. that Richard yeah. Ramirez, who at the time was living there. I mean, it's just, yeah. It, it's a fascination how America has... Prisoners and these, these bad guys are history. Yeah. And we know, we know they got their own documentaries and, and films and TV series. You know? Absolutely. But with Lead Belly, of course, he didn't have a fair trial. You know, it was very yeah. speedy. Yeah. It would have clearly been a self-defense case today. Mm-hmm. And so he ends up in Angola. And while he was there, the father and son, Alan and John Lomax, working with the Library of Congress, meet him. And he did the same thing again. Hey, I'll make a song for the governor. Can you see it? Send it to him. They didn't believe it. Sure enough, he came at their door and, w- and was released. So that's the legend is that he sung his way out two times. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, you, you only hear, I mean, stuff like that sounds like, oh, that's the stuff of movies, right? That's only, a, and speaking life. of which, a life, right. But it's speaking of which, how come a mo- has a movie been made about him at all? The only one is Gordon Parks. Last film. You haven't seen it? No. The 1976 one? No. Oh, wow. Okay. What's uh, it called? Lead Belly. Oh, it is called it's Lead Belly. Okay. And it, it only deals with his earlier, those early years around Dallas, Texas. So it doesn't deal with his later years in New York City. Okay. The guy, um, Mosley from Magnum P.I., uh, Walter Mosley. Yes. He right. plays Lead Belly. He plays Lead Belly. That okay. was his first film. Okay. Interesting. Well, that goes way back. That's, yeah. That was before Magnum P.I. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Gordon Parks was very talented. So, and for those of you that don't know, Gordon Parks was the director of Shaft. Yep. So, yeah. So we can, we can, yeah. And so, and we just lost Richard Roundtree last year. So, but, uh, wow. Well, okay. I'll, I'll have to look that up. I apologize. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that, but 
I'll certainly put a link in the show notes uh, for people to watch that. So, And I want to do, you know, the hopes is to, as we do this story and more of this, is to bring out another version of them. Yeah. You know, whether it's a series or another full length. I could totally see a series about Lead like Belly. Bass Reeves kind of almost. Oh, yeah. Bass Reeves is out now. And, and the star of that, David O, uh, and I, I always butcher his last name, but he starred as Martin Luther King and Selma, David o- Oyewelo. Mm-hmm. He talks about just the power of playing that role of Bass Reeves. I haven't watched it yet. I yeah, to. and it's and it's really important because he was basically one of the first marshals. And he's a black man. And, you know, we have a brand new U.S. Marshals Museum in Fort Smith now. Okay. Were you aware of that? No, I it's didn't. It's like brand new. I know his, new. his statue's in Fort Smith. Yeah, I know yeah. it is. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to tie those two. I actually want to take my kids down there so we can go to the museum. And I would encourage anybody listening to this. If you have some time and you're headed down to the River Valley at any point in time to definitely look up the U.S. Marshals Museum and take a visit for it, I think it would be well worth your time. And you could spend an afternoon there and there's quite a bit of history, including the history of Bass Reeves. Mm. Yeah. So it's worth checking out. It's definitely (laughs) worth checking out. So, well, listen. So, okay, so he talked his way out of jail twice. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man had a way with words. Mm -hmm. Clearly, he had a way with words to the point where his words are still resonating today. Correct. Right? So there's power and the ability for you to express yourself through language. And so what would you, I mean, for your family, Mm -hmm. what was your earliest recollection or understanding that, oh, I'm related to somebody famous? Like, I didn't know. Yeah. Like, I mean, I kind of understood it because I would see my grandfather on TV from time to time and people would talk about him and I didn't realize my grandfather was famous until I went to an event with him and Philip Michael Thomas was there from Miami Vice. <laughs> and boy, yeah, yeah so. it, it, this was like when Miami Vice was number one on, on TV. Okay. And my grandfather was headlining an event with him. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe this dude's. And I was like 15 at the time. And I was like, wow, okay. He really he clearly knew he, who he, he was. And yeah. Right, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm-hmm. it was, it was, and my grandfather was there and, and I was like, oh, okay, this is kind of big, but. For you, what was that age or when, when did you realize, oh, man, I'm connected with somebody that's really special? It has to be the postal stamp. OK. That may have been 92. OK. Yeah. 1992, early 90s. That's when I knew, you know, when you, it's like Chuck D, you know, most of my heroes don't appear in the stamp. stamps. Right. Right. And then four years later, literally he's on the on stamp. The stamp. Yeah. And it was a whole series of folk singers with him. Uh, Woody Guthrie, John, Sonny Terry, all of them, which is really, it's really good artwork. Yeah. That was the one time. Do you still have a picture of that anyway? Yeah, yeah. You do? Uh, I still got that. I might have to get that from yeah. you. So a copy of that. That looks good. Uh, there's been other slide references that I caught on from like Beck. You know, I'm a loser, baby. That guy, he's mm-hmm. a big Lead Belly fan. I mean, besides the connection when I learned about him was that prison partner on the wall. But yeah. when I knew that he was. Which you thought was a diploma. Right. It really was a diploma. He, <laughs> right. It was a diploma <laughs> that got him out. Got out of out. Got right. him out of It's out worth of, framing. Isn't it? Do you guys still have that? Yeah. It's, okay. a, it's actually next to the guitar at the museum. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's Interesting. Good. So many different. I mean, I can't. That's a good question. But it was probably the postal stamp. Okay. That was not 92. That was a while back. Yeah. yeah and I was yeah. still young. Uh so many influences yeah, uh, over. Yeah. So there's a guy that is a, named John Reynolds, who's a really big Lead Belly fan and friend of my grandmother. Mm-hmm. He would send me tons of articles, pull out some magazines. Anytime somebody mentioned it, he would, you know, connect the dots. And so he helped me also to learn a lot of these different things over time. I didn't, I would have never known. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like an artist, he would, he would find a sculptor. There's, uh, speaking of, there's a bronze, no, a stone sculpture in Dallas Museum of Art that is still there when a the guy made it of Lead Belly in 1948. Oh, really? And he's a real popular sculptor guy so, himself. I okay. can't think of the name right now. Okay. Interesting. And that's in the museum right there, you yeah. know? So, again, those friendships of people that he knew who then themselves became people. I yeah. think that itself is the fascinating part for me because they must have saw something in him. He was the oldest guy in the room. He clearly came from the hard times of the South. He clearly had some entertainment that he was providing. But if you've got a stone sculpture that nobody knows and he does one of Lead Belly and then 2024, it's in the museum. If you've got a film producer and 
then since I got this movie with a guy named James Dean, yeah, you know, if you got a young guy doing, you know, Harlem shows and this Harry Belafonte, you know, there was a, these interesting people that was always around him when they hadn't become who they were yet. Yeah. And it's so really the influence of Lead Belly lives on in the works of all of these individuals. Exactly. Because you mentioned Paul Robeson, you mentioned Harry Belafonte. So, I mean, yeah, that's exciting. And he was 60 when he died. Yeah. So he was still young. He was still young. Yeah. He was still young when he passed away. What we do know is that he did try to get in some Hollywood westerns. Okay. But he was too old. He had the oh, gray hair okay, and just yeah. didn't have the yeah. you know, the young guy look. Right, right. But he would have definitely lived it. <laughs> I'm sure he would have. So tell me how you how you see his the cultural and historical impact of his music into today. I the see significance it, of oh, it. the significance. Very important because it's the foundation for American roots music. Okay. Which then leads into rock and roll. Right. Hip hop blues, jazz. So I see him as important because he was an instrumentalist. So he played uh, an instrument. Mm -hmm. He was a storyteller. So he was someone who was giving us stories on what was going on in America at the time. He's important because of how he fought himself. You know, he's got his own protests. And then just on the personal level, that resilience, that self-determination, if you come from any condition, wherever you are, you know, in America or wherever, you can still come out of that. You know, mm-hmm. For him, he came from, you know, prison farms and still became somebody in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He wasn't Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because of his crimes and infamous bad guy character, but because he did songs that everybody enjoys. Good Night Irene, you know, children's songs, things like that. And so I think his significance as we are in a time where America's learning its past, mm-hmm. learning its old history, he's somebody who was actually telling us in real time about it. Yeah. Uh, what I want to do is now relate that into more digital, you know, media where there's, you know, interactive experiences, where there's film. How do we kind of connect those dots to today? You know, that's that's my whole key thing, because people like Tom Morello from Rage Against Machine, they know it. Someone like Chuck D, he knows it. Yeah. And th- these are all people that a lot of us are, you know, influenced by. Well, you know, and it's so funny you mentioned that. I think of like Rick Rubin and others. Yeah. I mean, these guys are like those guys. Like, I don't know if you've ever watched any of those Rick Rubin shows, like where, where they interview him in his studio there. No. In California. Uh-uh. It's impressive because he's always sitting there barefoot <laughs> talking about stuff. I mean, but the man is a student of the industry. Yeah. He's a student of music. And I tell people all the time, if you want to become good at something, you need to become a student of it. Yes. Right. And I, I you know, even That's like I feel like with podcasting, I've tried to become a student of podcasting to understand the the best podcasters out there and the best people that do it. But, you know, fill in the blank, whatever your you know fascination is with whatever, you know, creative force that you're excited about. You need to become a student. Of yeah. It. Put the time in. Put the hours, put the time, put the time in. in, I was in and and also to take it seriously. Yeah. So with Lead Belly's note. Uh, Pete Seeger again gave me a, and this, this is so funny because when we interviewed Pete Seeger, he lived in a log cabin mm-hmm. in upstate New York. He had the whole Hudson River in the background. And it was January, so it was cold, and the fireplace was cracking. Yeah, and I felt like a little, like a little small kid listening to some bedtime stories oh when I walked goodness. in. But Pete gave something that was very good. He said, while me and Woody and all of us were trying to play the average man you know, flannel shirts, jeans, and boots, lead belly wore tuxedos. Yeah. He came in on time. He looked at, hey, this is an opportunity, and I'm going to show my best. Yeah. Again, he was that example, which you're saying, you put in the time, and you take it serious, you know? Yeah, which which for a lot of people at that point in time, they wouldn't have given him the time of day, if you will, just to think that he would operate from that level. But what you're telling me is that he— he treated it like, I mean, he understood the value of what he was creating and he treated it like a business, but it was still art. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Whereas a lot of other people, it was art and it was art for art's sake. And, you know, whatever, I don't really care about the commercial aspect of it. I'm just, just out here playing my music. Yeah. And yeah. there is a difference. It is. There's definitely a difference. It definitely is. And it's, I'm not judging one way or the other in terms yeah. of people's deciding what, 
motivates them to do what they do, right? Because I, I get it. I mean, some people just want to paint. They want to paint. Some people just want to make music. Right. They don't want to be bought. They don't want to be encumbered by a bunch of other things or contracts and all this other right, stuff. Right, but, right, right. But I think it's important to understand that, you know, but for someone who was in a space where a lot of times things were just taken from them, your great, your great uncle really operated at a level where, you know, people had to respect what he was doing and make sure that they gave him space for him to do what he was doing. Absolutely. I agree about that. So he did end up his one time he went to Europe was in Paris. Okay. So he didn't go to London or anything. And that's why when you hear the people say Muddy Waters and then went to London first, Mm -hmm. that's true. But he went to Europe first. It was just Paris. Sure. Because you remember Paris at the time was jazz and black music. Yeah. And so, well, that's and, why Josephine Baker spent so much time so much out time there. out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He uh, also at that time period, as those jazz and the swing musicians thought that he was a little outdated. Mm-hmm. They didn't like the acoustic kind of southern accent, folk singing. They were wanting to go a little bit more faster, upbeat. But he stayed on what he knew. He stayed in his lane, and he still felt like, hey, there's a market for that. Yeah, and I think that that's also important too, because a lot of you know, creatives feel like, man, I've I've been doing this for 10 years and now I'm at this point. Now I got a little buzz. Do I now do what's, you know, the most popular thing today? No, stick to what, what you know, what you know, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and I think that's a good you know word of advice for people. I mean, I think it is right, because, I mean, you look at today and everybody's like, oh, well, you know, the, the TikTokification of everything. Yeah. Everything may, is not necessarily meant to be disseminated on TikTok. Right. I think TikTok's a great platform for what it does. Right. Capturing the minds and the ideas of people and sharing information. And if you're looking for a mass ability to get your information out, that certainly is one of them. But if you're also looking to do something where you can have a sounding board Mm -hmm. for what you're doing Mm -hmm. and you get that feedback, there's nothing like playing, you know, a small club with 20 seats. Yeah. Because it's just a different feel. Yeah. It is just a different feel. So, you know, I was looking at uh, Robert Glasper. He was doing some, he was performing at the Blue Note in New York versus like the North Sea Jazz Festival. I mean, Mm -hmm. thousands of people in the stands for the North Sea Jazz Festival. Blues Festival, Blue Note, New York City. I mean, that club, I think it holds maybe like 30 people, 40 (laughs) people. It's small. It's Mm -hmm. like the, it's like, you know, some of the other smaller jazz places. And there's a reason why they're small because they're small and they're intimate and it gives the chance for uh, the creator to have a real connection with the audience. It's kind of like, kind of like the tiny desk. Yeah, effect. you oh, know, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not an audience, but it's. Do you think Lead Belly would have done it? Oh, he would. He would have loved that. <laughs> he would have definitely loved that. Oh man, he would have. I think that would have been cool. I watch a bunch of those. I mean, I watched all of them during the pandemic, but I mean, you know, that is, it's amazing what it you can do. It pulls something with. different out of the artists that we normally see. It does. I, I, I agree with that. It really does, man. Gosh, look, we could go on and on. I mean, there's so much we could talk about, and we, and I think we've talked about you know, some of the cultural and historical impact of Lead Belly and certainly his impact is still being felt today. What are your hopes as you move forward, as you're one of the stewards of the Lead Belly platform and, and the story, what are you hoping to accomplish with Lead Belly here in Northwest Arkansas? Good question. What I would like to accomplish is first do a screening. I want the people to see it here. I okay. want to see it on the big screen. And I would like to work on a series of when I mean, you say screening of uh, the, the doc- documentary. So the documentary is Lead Belly, the man who invented rock and roll. OK. All right. And we've had we've been in two film festivals so far, Nashville and one in New York. And now I'm going to you know take the show on the road with that is to collaborate with different organizations or institutions, you know, sure. museums out here. Yeah. And, or your, you know, your theater squares or Walton's art centers and things like that to now possibly bring it here for an actual performance. So one part, see the documentary, but then the next part, is there an exhibit that I can do? Yeah. Uh, or is there a tribute concert? Yeah. You know, we see the tribute Prince and, you know, tribute Michael Jackson concerts and people show up. So we're the artists. So now another good answer is, who are the artists here in Northwest? If you're here, please contact Randy, blow his email box up and say, you know, their belly cover songs. And you're more than w- welcome to to link with me and, and do a Lead Belly concert. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I think that would be fun. Definitely. Yeah, I would and, listen. If anybody, seriously, if anybody's listening to this, 
and even remotely is connected with someone or you are that someone that has an interest and getting Lead Belly's music out there and you've played it before, you've done the covers, uh, holler at your boy and I'm going to put you in touch with Alvin and let's put something together, right? And uh, continue to move the story of Lead Belly out there to the widest audience possible. Because I think there's a whole new generation of folks that, that haven't even discovered Lead Belly. Yet. No. And just think, my daughter, 13-year-old, walks around with the Nirvana shirt. <laughs> yes. You see kids run yeah, with yeah. it, right? Right. Well, in the MTV Unplugged, Kurt says our favorite artist is Lead Belly. Lead Belly. And then he goes and sings, you know, Get where did you sleep last? You, know, you haven't seen that clip? I've, I've heard you mention okay. something about that. And I was a huge Nirvana Kurt event? Cobain fan. I wasn't at the time. I was. I, I mean, I, I got it like right I away. I did not. Like I didn't the, get the it. The moment that it came out, I was just like, wow, okay, this is on a whole nother level. And when he died, I was just like, wow. So, so he sad. was a huge fan. I mean, we've got the cassette tape. A guy sent me a picture from Seattle of a cassette tape that he actually had. He had we got pictures of him wearing a T-shirt that he we didn't even sell. Like yeah. he must have bought it from a fan club. Sure. So he was a real. So yes, and anybody who are doing Nirvana covers and Nirvana influence, just hey, go back in the in archives, do your own version of In the Pines. That's amazing. Yeah, well, that's that whole grunge yep. uh, scene up in the Pacific Northwest that includes Pearl Jam, Nirvana. I mean, you yep. just so it's it's crazy when you think of. I mean, you almost get goosebumps thinking about the influence that a man from Shreveport, Louisiana, had. On the world, but specifically on on the music here in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. It's powerful. It's very powerful. I mean, that, to me, it almost hurt my head to be thinking about, man, there's just so many different synapses here, connections that need to be made, right? That's just where one I'm at. Person. Right. I know. <laughs> and that's, that's where I'm at because there's murals. Someone sent me a picture at the Slutty Vegan restaurant in Dallas. He's on the wall. Oh, so man, who's I that artist that? There. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> so who's the artist that made that painting? Right. You know, I told you he's in the bus in Dallas Museum. Oh, so my who, gosh. This is not even music stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. we talked about Gordon Parks did a film. Well, there needs to be a mural of him in Deep Ellum in Dallas. That would be cool. That would be nice. But as as much as they create murals around here, they should create one. That'd be cool if they, if somebody did did a mural around here of Lead Belly. So Olivia Trimble, if you're listening, or any of the other talented artists out there, you want to do a Lead Belly mural, let us know because I think it would be worthwhile to do. So that would be nice and do a late little concert or something right in front of it or some yeah. tribute. That would be nice. And so we have you to thank really for that connection with Lead Belly here, which, you know, was one of the influences of the juke joint at, yep. the, at, the, Orson, at the prior yep. center and with music Orson education. Weems and yep. Shout out to the music education initiative. I mean, what Orson's doing is amazing and he gets it. He understands it. So, but. And that's why I like with the, uh, the juke joint is because that's an actual physical space. Yeah. So he's provided a space. And now, you know, to do another event, that would be perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Alvin, man, thank you so much for taking time to sit down with me again. The, the, you're kind of like a, a second guest on the podcast. Uh, again, the last time we were talking about something totally different, but this time we're talking <laughs> about your family and, and the amazing Lead Belly. And uh, certainly I want to encourage anyone that is listening to this episode. If you've never heard a Lead Belly song, I'm going to put, I'm going to try to figure out and put a, a Lead Belly playlist together and I'm going to attach it to the, the show notes. Just check it out for yourself and see if you can't notice tracks, if you can't notice bars from what Lead Belly has created that you've heard on more contemporary music. Because I, I, pro- I guarantee you, you'll find it. So. I, I didn't ask, when did you first hear about it? Like, how did you know? I didn't, I, you didn't I'm ashamed even, to say this. I didn't know about Lead Belly until you gave me, gotcha. you gave me the little book. And, but you knew there was little things that I, probably over your yes, time it started yeah. coming back. Well, yeah. and, and I knew that there was a precursor to Johnny Cash, that he was influenced by a black man. I just didn't know the black man's name. I wasn't, I just, people had told me, oh, well, you know, Johnny Cash, Got it he was him. influenced by this guy. And I didn't, I couldn't remember the name or anything like that. But then you and I connected. And then you gave me the little discography, and then I put two and two together, and that's where, where well, it goes. So thank you, man, for Speaking the show. Of which and- I need to get that back to you, but but yes, it it is suffice to say, it is a pleasant surprise to be so closely connected to someone who is kin with with this individual, right? You know, be like kind of be like meeting somebody that's Elvis Presley's great niece, right, or great nephew, and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, this is this is it. So, uh, but anyway, I I appreciate you, Alvin, coming. 
to sit down with us and, and to share your story and to share the story of Lead Belly. And I really want to encourage everybody listening to this. This was more like a history lesson episode of the podcast with a Northwest Arkansas connection. And it's Arkansas's all throughout this. So, you know, just I hope you guys understand the significance of this episode. But thank you so much, man. Thank for, you for joining us. And, and we really appreciate you. If anybody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? You can go to the website, houseofleadbelly.com. Okay. And you can actually email me at leadbellyarchive okay. at gmail. Okay. So we'll, we'll put all that in the show notes, but houseofleadbelly.com. Yep. And uh, they will be able to go ahead and, and check that information out and connect with you. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So, but listen, man, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, just sharing your a little bit of history with us. So thanks a lot, man. Absolutely. Take care. Absolutely. Well, folks, there you have it. Another episode of the I am Northwest Arkansas podcast. I hope you enjoyed that. I took so many notes and I will certainly share all this information with you in the show notes, but Alvin's a dear friend and and I'm so excited to be able to help expand his platform with the folks in our listening audience. And so we hope you enjoyed this. Remember the I am Northwest Arkansas podcast comes out every Monday, rain or shine. You can also check us out every Tuesday on an episode of Ozarks at Large, which runs both at 12 and at 7. And uh, again, if you like these type of podcasts, you like these these stories that we're telling, please reach out and let us know. Just reach out to us and we'd be happy to hear from you. We've got a lot in store for for 2024. And uh, so we hope to bring you more episodes like this. And again, we really appreciate you listening and we appreciate everyone that's part of the I Am Northwest Arkansas Tribe. I am your host, Randy Wilburn, and we'll see you back here next week with another new episode. Peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of I Am Northwest Arkansas. Check us out each and every week, available anywhere that great podcasts can be found. For show notes or more information on becoming a guest, visit IamNorthwestArkansas.com. We'll see you next week on I Am Northwest Arkansas.